So good morning, everyone, and happy Monday. Uh, we're going to continue after the short pause that we had because of our midterm exam with uh, the one of the main goals, or rather uh, with the um, connection between the Laplace transform and differential equation. So we're going to see some further properties. of the Laplace transform. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the inverse Laplace transform. We have all already looked at this, but uh, today we're going to do a little bit more systematic uh, work. And uh, finally, we're going to see how to solve solving uh, differential equations of ODs. Not all ODs. <laughs> you will see that we're talking about a very specific type of uh, ODs, ordinary differential equations, in other words. Um, by using the Laplace transform. Uh, I, I would like to give you a brief reminder on the Laplace transform. So uh, even though we said the formula is not going to be relevant for us at any point, meaning I'm not going to ask you to, to make any, to do any computations using uh, the formula, it is important to know what the formula is. So the formula is the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative st f of t dt. So that's the Laplace transform of a function, not any function. It, it has to be a pretty decent function. And uh, it's fair to say that in this course, uh, we're only interested in pretty decent functions. So um, the Laplace transform of almost any function we would be interested in will exist. So um, what do I mean by that? Uh, for example, the function should not um, grow too fast because otherwise the Laplace transform may not uh, converge, this integral may not converge. And it should also have, uh, it should be fairly continuous. You're going to see that we will allow discontinuities. In fact, in some sense, uh, one of the, um, true highlight, one of the true uh, upshots of what we're doing right now will be to be able to solve uh, equations, even in the case that uh, we don't expect continuity for the solutions. You, you will see what I mean next time. But uh, for the moment being, let me remind you that uh, the most important formulas to know here are the following. The Laplace transform is linear. So this means that it transforms the sum of two functions into the sum of the Laplace transforms. And the uh, product by a constant number to the corresponding product of the Laplace transform by the same uh, constant number. And uh, for specific functions, the Laplace transform of t to the n is uh, n factorial over s to the n plus one. The Laplace transform of e to the at is uh, the Laplace is one over s minus a. The Laplace transform of uh, cosine of bt is um, s over uh, s squared plus b squared. The Laplace transform of uh, sine of bt is b over s squared plus b squared. And uh, more generally, if you want to take the Laplace transform of a function multiplied by uh, the exponential function, then uh, this will be pretty much the Laplace transform of the original function shifted, uh, where uh, f of s is the Laplace transform of f of t. Okay, so these are the formulas that uh, we have seen so far. Yeah. 
And uh, before I proceed today, I would like to add two more formulas to uh, this. And you will see, I mean, we will have a couple more uh, things to uh, say here, but that's uh, pretty much all the formulas that we will need for our Laplace transform. So um, the next formula has to do with uh, what happens if you take the Laplace transform of a uh, derivative of a function. And this is where things get interesting because look, um, the, the derivative is obtained through a limiting process, right? Um, it turns out that uh, when you take the Laplace transform, you actually get an algebraic expression of, I'm sorry, when you take the Laplace transform of the derivative of a function, uh, you actually end up with an algebraic expression of the Laplace transform of the function. It turns out that it's equal to uh, S uh, times the Laplace transform of F uh, when viewed as a function of S uh, minus F of zero. And uh, this, this term uh, F of zero already tells you that uh, somehow we will have, um, it will be much more convenient for us to consider initial value problems that are centered at zero rather than at other points. Of course, it is possible to, uh, to consider other points, but you will see that pretty much we'll be talking about initial value problems that are related to, uh, that are, uh, have to do with uh, uh, the point zero. And uh, please understand that this formula can be generalized for uh, higher derivatives. So for the second derivative, you will have S squared times the Laplace transform of the uh, uh, function uh, minus uh, S times uh, F of zero minus F prime of zero. So that's the, uh, and then you, you can tell from this what the general pattern is going to be. So if you want to take the Laplace transform of the third derivative, then you will have S cubed times the Laplace transform of the uh, function minus S squared times F of zero minus S times F prime of zero minus F double prime of zero. And the story keeps going. Really the two formulas that we're going to need here are just these two because we're going to um, pretty much restrict our attention to uh, solving um, uh, second order linear equations using uh, the Laplace transform. Okay, but I, I just want to see that there is an obvious um, generalization. Any questions so far, please? Now, th there is another formula, which uh, you might argue that it's kind of um, uh, a companion to this formula. So, so you see how the Laplace transform of a derivative turns into multiplying by a power of uh, S and subtracting some appropriate polynomial. Well, it turns out that, that uh, it also works the other way around. So if you take a function and you multiply it by T, and then you try to take the Laplace transform, what you get actually is the derivatives uh, of the uh, Laplace transform. And all of these formulas actually depend on uh, integration by parts. Uh, here, I won't try to, to give you any, any uh, proofs. Of course, uh, the proofs, uh, you can find proofs in the uh, indicative book that I had suggested in the beginning of the semester. Um, and um, the, the proofs are, are very simple actually. But uh, here, basically, what we're saying is that uh, uh, if you multiply by t in advance, <laughs> excuse me, uh, then uh, you're taking the you're obtaining the derivative of the Laplace transform, and exactly because. Um, integration by parts is involved and in integration by parts, you have that uh, negative sign that you get uh, on the other side of the equation. Uh, there will be a negative one to the end. You know what, maybe maybe actually I should show you this one, just, just one thing. Okay, so 
if I start with the Laplace transform of t f of t, then this would be the integral from zero to infinity of v to the negative st t f of t, right? You can consider it like this. And uh, now the idea is what? Uh, you want to um, apply uh, integration by parts. So what, what will be the thing uh, for which uh, you will have a, um, actually for, for this one, I should say um, it's, uh, no, it's, it's, it's a much fancier thing. This is not actually integration by parts. So I, I would have to take it back. What you have here is the partial derivative with respect to s of the quantity e to the negative st uh, t f of t dt f of t just this so it turns out that uh, and you need an, an extra negative sign actually uh, so if you consider t to be constant and uh, s to be your variable then uh, the thing that you have inside the integral is exactly the derivative of what I just gave you. And there is a, uh, a theorem according to which um, you can actually under uh, some, some uh, good conditions that are satisfied, uh, some appropriate conditions that are satisfied in uh, the case that we're studying, you can actually interchange differentiation with integration. And this pretty much will give you, uh, so you can take this outside. Of course, now the uh, derivative will become an ordinary derivative and you will have the um, integral from zero to infinity of negative e to the negative st. Um, oops, that t is not needed here. Uh, f of t dt. And that is going to give you uh, minus uh, d over ds of uh, the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative st f of t to t, uh, which is um, simply minus d over ds of the Laplace transform of n. So uh, first of all, I'm sorry for uh, saying that uh, it's uh, just integration by parts, but the, the other formula uh, depends on integration by parts. This depends on this property, which is a very interesting property. You never saw that in uh, Calc 2 because uh, for this to have any meaning, you need to consider um, integrals that have a parameter along with uh, their variable. And this is exactly the kind of integral where you have the parameter S that eventually merges as the variable of the Laplace transform once the integration has been um, carried out. Okay, there, there's a very general mathematical theory of such uh, processes uh, that is usually here people usually could call the e to the negative st, they would call it a kernel that has uh, two um, variables. The one variable, the variable t is consumed uh, through integration and the variable s emerges as the variable of whatever you get. But in any case, allow me to close this parenthesis and not come back to anything like that. I think it was just worthwhile seeing uh, very, very quickly uh, how uh, this property is, is uh, proven. But uh, let me now go to the uh, inverse Laplace transform, which we have already discussed. So we have discussed what happens if somebody gives you a... Uh, function and they ask you what kind of uh, they give you a function of s and they ask you what kind of um, function of t did we take the Laplace transform of in order to come up with something like this and the idea here in order to be able to answer that question is actually quite simple the idea is that you need to um, write whatever is given to you in a form that is recognizable from this list right here. Specifically, specifically, 
uh, one of these forms right here. Okay. The things that you will understand right away is that uh, if you look at uh, what I, I wrote on the other page as my uh, function that I would like to find, uh, uh, or the Laplace transform that I would like to find what function it came from, uh, you will understand that uh, you have a polynomial of the second degree that has actually, uh, yeah, you, you may have to split into different pieces. And, and actually, let me just uh, change slightly what I gave you on the other page. Uh, the, the one that I gave you is possible. No, let, let, let's just do this. I mean, it's, it's fine. And then we'll do another one like, um, so in any case, um, you will realize that, that basically the things that you want to see, uh, no, no, actually you will see it, it has nothing to do with cosine. I, I intended to have cosine here, but you will see that it has nothing to do with cosine. And here's why. Um, ask yourselves, what are the things that you can actually recognize? So uh, if somebody told you, what is the inverse Laplace transform of a power of uh, S, so S to the fourth, what do you do in such a case? You know that you have the obstacle of, um, uh, the numerator that doesn't match exactly the formula. The formula says n factorial over s to the n plus one. s to the n plus one here is s to the fourth. So n should be three and you should have that three factorial. But what did we uh, show uh, the last time that we did uh, Laplace transform? We actually did something like this. We multiplied and divided by what we're missing, which is six, not three, which is six. And now this thing can be recognized. So this is uh, n factorial over s to the n plus one for n equals three. And so now we can argue that uh, this came from one sixth t to the third power, okay? Then uh, the, the other thing that is possible to um, recognize here is when you have um, not a power of s, but rather a power of a monomial, something like um, s plus five uh, to the fourth. Let's say we have something very analogous. So you would start by writing it the same way. So you need that six on the numerator. But now you have to ask yourself, how, how am I going to identify this as coming from one of the functions that we saw before? And the crucial property here that you should use is which one? It's this one right here. Okay, so, so it tells you that normally, yes, you should have expected uh, uh, t cubed, but in fact, it's going to be multiplied by uh, the exponential function so that you have the shift. The shift. And the shift is by what? Uh, you have s plus one. s plus one is the same thing as s minus negative one. So, so pretty much, uh, I think if we put everything together, this will give us uh, one sixth, right? And then you have uh, t to the third power, right? But it doesn't end here. You need to put e to the uh, negative five t, okay? Because if you have this e to the negative five t, then s is going to be replaced by s minus negative five, meaning s plus five, and that's, that's it. Okay, so, um, so the question is when somebody gives you something like this, what do you do? And the answer is the first step that you should take is either, uh, complete, either complete the square if you don't have any roots or on the denominator or represent uh, the, uh, so in general, complete the square. So make it as, to, to have some power of a monomial. And here, uh, what is this equal to? It's equal to uh, S over S plus one squared. That's how we complete the square here. And, and now we have a, again, one more problem. We, we, we were asking, okay, how, I mean, we haven't seen anything that, that produces this S here. 
right? That's that's a big problem. And and this NS, let me let me stress this that this NS it's not a a five, it's the letter S, and that creates a problem because we haven't seen anything in our formulas that had something like that. So now, what we need to um, do is partial fraction decomposition. Oops, calc two. Did we pay attention to partial fraction decomposition? Uh, let me remind you that uh, partial fraction decomposition allows you, or the method of partial fractions, allows you to write this as a over s plus one squared plus b over s plus one. So you have to put all the power starting with um, the uh, actual power that you get with the actual power that you have, which is two. And then you go down to um, the first power. So how do you determine A and B? You clear denominators. Uh, this is A actually, plus B times S plus one over S plus one squared. And now the idea, the main idea here is that this should be equal to that. And so what you do, is you rearrange the terms. So you write BS plus A plus B. So now the way you think about this is that this is the same as one times S plus zero. So S is the same thing as one times S plus zero. Uh, if it goes to the third power, as you're asking, you would have had three terms. So it would have been A over S plus one to the third power plus B over S plus one squared plus C over S plus one. So, so you have to have as many terms as the power in the case of a uh, monomial like this. Um, and, uh, and, and so here what happens is that uh, the number one should be this number B here. And the zero should be the, the number a plus b. Now over, of course, I didn't write this, but over s plus one squared. Okay, uh, which tells you right away that b has to be one and a has to be negative one. So uh, b is one, a is negative one. And now we can finish the whole thing. So we can write, uh, S over S plus one squared is equal to uh, one over S plus one squared minus um, one over S plus one. And the inverse Laplace transform of this will be the inverse Laplace transform of one over S plus one squared, which would be what? So normally you have T, but exactly because you have S plus one is, it's S minus negative one. So it's T e to the negative T. And the other one is simply minus e to the negative T. And that's all. Okay. Let me give you an example like this to do yourself. So uh, try this one, please. Find the inverse Laplace transform of S plus three. S plus two over um, S squared minus six S plus nine. Give it a try, I'll give you a couple of minutes.
Okay, uh, the first thing that we need to do here is complete the square, right? So how do we complete the square here? This is the same thing as uh, S minus three all square, right? And so what we should try to do is take S plus two over S minus three square and write it as A over S minus three squared plus B over S minus three. So clear the denominators and you will have A plus B times S minus three over S minus three squared. And this splits now into um, BS plus uh, a minus 3b over s minus 3 squared. And now the idea is that uh, you can think of s plus 2 as 1 times s plus 2. And the number 1 should be equal to b. And the number uh, 2 should be equal to a minus 3b. That's the idea. And this will give you b is equal to 1. Once you know that b is equal to 1, Actually, let me write the equation so that you can see it. So these are the two equations. So once you know that B is equal to one, you plug it into the second one and that gives you A minus three is equal to two, which means that A is equal to five. So that means that uh, when you're looking for the Laplace transform of S plus two over S squared minus six S plus nine, that's the same thing as looking uh, for the Laplace transform of um, five over S minus three squared uh, plus uh, one over uh, S plus one. And of course, for five over s minus three square, uh, you're going to have the five in front. There's no adjustment to be made because the power is two, which means it um, uh, goes together with one factorial. And uh, this will be uh, t times e to the uh, 3t. And then you also have uh, 3t, I'm sorry, this should be three, not s plus one s minus three and um, plus e to the three t and that questions please uh, yeah i have a question so the way that i learned how to do this the whole um you know a over s minus three squared plus b over s minus three squared and you know that initial part over there i mean how did you move from those that part to the part that's right after that because the way we learned it back in calc 2 was you would just simply multiply by s minus 3 squared which would leave you with you know a plus b um times s minus 3 but where did you get the over s minus 3 squared from uh, you have a fraction uh, you clear denominators and uh, you end up having two fractions that um uh, have the same denominator. So the only way that this can work is if they have the same numerator. Okay. Uh, there is actually no uh, other way on uh, uh, this one. What you just described could be some kind of uh, computational shortcut that is not even necessarily justified, but um, uh, I'm sorry, not justified or formally correct, I should say. But uh, that's the standard way that things are done here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not uh, not different inverses. Maybe inverses that can be given in slightly different ways, but but not different inverse. So you shouldn't be able to find something which is uh, completely different. Okay. You shouldn't be able to find something that's completely different. And and to follow up uh, on what I was saying before. Uh, the 
I, I, I think what you described about uh, multiplying by s minus three over square is, is just the process of clearing denominators. But uh, you know, regardless, um, the idea here is, is pretty simple. The important step is how you're going to prescribe things. So it's, it's really this. So if we agree on this, that we're prescribing it uh, this way, how you're going to find A and B, I will leave it up to you. So I'm not going to, uh, you know, even, uh, I shouldn't even have said, uh, you know, <laughs> that that is formally, possibly formally uh, uh, incorrect. If it works, it works, that's great. I just showed you here from scratch, one standard way of finding this, okay. And you will see that uh, this works in, uh, um, so, so we have two more cases that I would like to explain. So the next case is what happens if it's not a square? What happens if you have uh, two roots? So let's look at this. So what happens if you have something like, um, uh, we want to find the inverse Laplace transform of S over S square minus three S plus two. What happens if we uh, want to find this, right? Then, then here, again, the question is, uh, does this, uh, can this be, do you, can you complete the square? Does it have roots? But here, you can see that this has roots. So this can be written as uh, S over S minus two times S minus one. So now what do you do? Uh, again, this is the important step. How do we prescribe the partial fraction the composition, and the answer is a over uh, s minus two plus a b over s minus one. Okay, and and again here you can actually uh, clear denominators. So this will be a times s minus one uh, plus b times s minus two. Okay, so so that's the way that you put this fraction into. Uh, you make this the sum of two fractions into one fraction. And here the idea is that you have again two fractions that are equal to each other. So this has to be equal to that, right? So S has to be equal to A times S minus one plus B times S minus two, okay? And, and I think that, that uh, yeah, and, and, and you can see from here, uh, now I see what you mean. So, so what you said is perfectly fine, even formally. What you said is you multiply both sides by S minus two times S minus one, right? This is what you would do here, right? And, and you get the same equation, okay? And you get this. So I got this just by clearing the denominators, okay? So uh, in any case, uh, you have to write this as uh, S is A plus B times S uh, plus um, minus A minus two B. And now what you should have is that A plus B should be equal to one and minus A minus two B should be equal to zero. So this tells you that uh, A is equal to minus two B so you will get that um, the first equation will turn into minus b is equal to one, b is equal to negative one. And once you know that b is equal to negative one, you find that a is equal to two. Okay, so it turns out that uh, this inverse Laplace transform will be, uh, two over S minus two minus one over S minus one. So how much is this? It's two times the function one times e to the two t uh, minus uh, e to the t, that's all. Questions, please. Okay, uh, could you please try one now 
uh, yourselves. So let's do this. Could you please find the inverse Laplace transform of um, S plus one over S square plus S minus six. Okay, give it a try please. Okay, so why don't we uh, take a look at this together? Um, so, so the first thing is, uh, how do we factorize this? And it's S uh, minus two times S plus three, right? So uh, we would like to do S plus one over S minus two times S plus three is A over S minus two plus S plus B over S plus three. And <laughs> again, I'm trying to redeem myself from for, for uh, making the mistake of saying that uh, what uh, uh, my friend suggested was formally incorrect. It was perfectly fine. So you can fact, you can multiply both sides by by this. That's another way of clearing denominators. What happened? What's going on? Something wrong? And 
S squared plus S minus six. S, S minus two times S plus three. Yeah. Oh, this is correct. Okay. So you will get A times S plus three plus B times S minus two. Okay. And uh, you know what? Uh, here, here there is a trick, actually. You don't even have to solve the system. Does anybody know what the trick is? Here there's a trick for this case where you have distinct roots on the denominator. There's a trick. The trick is to set S is equal first to negative three. If you set S equal to negative three, then what you get is on the left, you get minus two. And on the right, you get zero, eight times zero plus B times negative five. So that gives you right away that B is equal to two fifths. And uh, then you set S equal to two. How do you choose uh, negative three and two? These are exactly the roots of these quantities, right? The idea is you plug them in and all but one becomes zero on the right hand side. So uh, this will give you three is equal to uh, A times five plus b times zero. So this gives you that a is equal to three over five. Uh, you know why I'm saying that this is a trick because it works fine when you have um, two distinct roots. Okay, in general, what you get is a system. And if you have uh, factors that are in uh, higher powers, so, so here, for example, in the previous one, uh, the, the only thing you could, you could plug in is three. Okay, one might argue, yes, then I can plug in something else, plug in zero and also get that one. Uh, all I'm saying, uh, okay, let me put it this way. Okay, try to apply this to a situation where you have multiple uh, uh, factors. So try to apply this in a situation that you have something like this, uh, S uh, times uh, S squared plus S plus five over S minus three squared times S plus one to the fourth and so on, something like that. Okay, y you will see that here, you will need to determine six coefficients. And by plugging in three and four, you're actually going to, to just find two of them. And you will have four more to go. Okay, that's why I cannot call it the method. It, it doesn't work all the time like this. Okay, will it work for the situation that you have degree two? Yes. But, but what I want you to understand is that the underlying structure that you have to, to uh, deal with is a system. Okay. Now, how you solve the system can is is up to you. It can be done in different ways, and and that's a uh, you know pretty slick way of doing things in this particular setup. But I, I can't call this a method. Okay, and and then again, one might argue, well, uh, how about we start plugging in other numbers as equals zero? Then then you're not going to get everything to go away. Okay. But whenever it works, <laughs> please use it by all means. So, um, so here we will have uh, the inverse Laplace transform of S plus one over S squared plus S minus six is equal to the inverse Laplace transform of uh, three over five times one over S minus two plus two over five times one over uh, S plus three. And now we can finally give the answer. So this is going to be um, three uh, over five times e to the two t uh, plus two over five times e to the negative three t. And that's it. Questions, please. Questions?
Okay. Uh, so now let's look at uh, the, the, the situation where we have no roots. So, so here's, here's the situation. What if we want to find the inverse Laplace transform of S over S square plus two S plus phi? Okay, now if you find the, the discriminant of this polynomial that you have on the bottom, you will see that it's uh, um, negative, which means you don't have any real roots here. So no real roots. Uh, so somebody might, might possibly ask here, can we do the whole business with uh, complex roots and then mimic everything that we had with complex roots? And the answer is yes, but you will go through complex numbers and eventually you can sort of eliminate them and come back to reality. Reality here doesn't mean, uh, you know, the um, uh, situation surrounding us in, uh, <laughs> in the actual world. It means the, the uh, state of being of working with real numbers. But uh, there's a better way. And the better way is to complete the square. So how do we complete the square? Let, let me remind you, and again, here, and, and this is where um, I would like to, to emphasize that all algebra that you have learned, whether it's something that I have in mind and I suggest or I don't suggest, and but you know it and you feel comfortable with it, is perfectly acceptable. Let me put it that way so that we clear that uh, once and for all. I'm not going to insist that if I solve it one way using a system or using a trick or using this or using that, that you have to mimic that way. Okay, uh, in some sense, what I'm suggesting is that this is a lower level problem that what we're, than what we're studying right now. Okay, how should I put it? If, if you know, uh, the uh, multiplication table came up and, and uh, <laughs> for some reason, in this course and I, I, I would say, okay, that's how I know the multiplication table or that's how I do it. And you do it some other way, we're not going to argue about that. So we can keep uh, those methods uh, the way that everybody knows them. If you, if you like any of the algebraic methods that I'm showing you here, I would, I would um, advise you to, to learn them. But if you're fine with the algebraic methods that you have learned so far, they're perfectly applicable, okay? So I would like to, to clarify this and, and also add to it that it's not like there's one universal method. So, but, but here, the way that you um, complete the square, so here is the nightmare of having S and five in the same. Uh, so let me play with the serifs here again. And uh, uh, what do I do? Uh, again, this is one way that I'm going to show you. Uh, you write this as a double product, the middle term, and then you recognize that you're missing the square of one. So what you do is you subtract and add the square of one of what you're missing. And of course, don't forget your five. And now it turns out that these three terms together form a perfect square, right? So this is going to be, uh, S plus one all squared plus, uh, and then you have minus one plus five, which is plus four. Okay. So, so now this can be written as and this is where things actually get more interesting than they were before. And I did show you an example like this a few days ago when we first did the Laplace transform, does anybody remember what the next step is here, which is, which is a crucial step, which is a crucial step. You have an imbalance here. What is the imbalance? This, this S that you have here doesn't match the S plus one. Okay, fine, four is going to be two squared. Okay, so, so you need to do that. But, but no, what do you do about the imbalance? No, you can't square something as it's sitting there. No, you can't, you can't just square that. There you go. You add and subtract one. You add and subtract one, very good. Okay, so you create the same thing pretty much. So S over S plus one minus one 
over s plus one square plus four. So, so the idea here is to make sure that the quantity s plus one shows up. And now you split it up. Um, minus one over s plus one square plus four. The first fraction is really nice. It comes from um, from uh, s uh, uh, from from a cosine. There is a small problem with the second one. It, it doesn't uh, you know necessarily work right away. You need you need something. Well, what is it that you need? Can anybody tell me? Again, you need an adjustment here. What, what bothers us here is that one on the numerator, this, this number. What would we want to have instead of one? What would be nice to have? Yes, we would like to have two. We don't have two, so what do we do? Not, not, not add two, be careful here. Multiply and divide, multiply and divide. Okay, so so. So I will rewrite this as L to the negative one of, yes, fine, let me do that now finally, because I think that many of you wanted to see this. So write this as two square minus one half times two over S plus one plus two square. And I think that now we're all set, we can go ahead and uh, write this in the desired way, which is what, so this, normally would have been cosine of 2t, right? But how do we account for that s plus one? Multiply by e to the negative t, right? And then you would have one over two sine of 2t. And again, how do you account for that s plus one? By multiplying by uh, e to the negative t. And that's it, okay? So uh, here's what I would like you to do. I would like you to do one and then take your break at the same time. So uh, please give this a try. Uh, I'm gonna give you one that, that is going to be a little ugly, a little, not, 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 not too ugly. Okay, a little uglier than this. Sorry about this. So S squared plus uh, 4S plus, uh, 11, ouch. Um, yeah, uh, give this a try and uh, take your break. So we're going to resume in, in about 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to uh, pause the recording here. Okay, so uh, when we complete the square here, what do we get? We get S square S plus two squared plus seven, right? Do we all agree? So how do we transform this? Now you want to create an S plus two, right? This is where things can get interesting. That's why I put this three because you have to do it inside the parentheses, S plus two minus two over S plus two squared plus seven. And this is uh, three times S plus two over S plus two plus square root of seven square right and then you have minus six and what do you want to do you want to create that square root of seven on the top so square root of seven on the bottom square root of seven on the top s plus two squared plus square root of seven all squared and now we can say what it is it's cosine of square root of seven t times e to the negative 2t minus six over square root of seven uh, sine of square root of seven t times e to the negative 2t and that's it. Okay, 
let me, uh, for, for completeness purposes, let me show you how to complete the square here. So you have S square plus 4S plus 11. This is the same thing as S plus two times uh, S times two. So you have this extra two, which leads you to do plus two square minus two square plus 11. And this is S plus two square plus seven. And that's it. Question, please. So I, I think in the homework that um, I have assigned for, let me, let me double check that. I, I don't think I'm giving you anything higher than second degree uh, on the denominator, I mean. Uh, no, actually I give you something of the third degree. So, so let me uh, just um, give you a hint for this even though it's, it's uh, so uh, I have one problem that looks like this. And here, how sh are you supposed to prescribe it? So you put uh, A over S plus three squared plus B over S plus three and then plus C over S plus one, okay? And then uh, you, can, you can either clear denominators the way I showed you, or you can multiply by S plus three squared times S plus one. And if you plug in negative three and negative one, you're going to find A and B. And then you will have to, to use one of the uh, equations to find uh, uh, C. Um, I'm sorry, you are going to find actually uh, A, I think B, B and C actually. So all but except for one. And uh, then you will need to find the third one, which you can find it either by plugging in any other value of S that you like, or by using um, one of the coefficients to be equal to uh, the corresponding coefficient on the left. So either of the two is going to work just fine. Okay. Any questions? So now I would like to come to the upshot of today's lecture, which is how to use all this in order to solve uh, a, an initial value problem. So imagine that you have the, the uh, two equations that we will need that we gave earlier are that the Laplace transform of F prime is equal to S times the Laplace transform of F uh, minus F of zero. And the Laplace transform of F double prime is S times S squared times F minus S times F of zero minus uh, uh, F prime of zero. I'm sorry, there was a question on the on the chat let me see what it was no 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 I, I actually I'm afraid this is a misconception what I, what I just gave you here is also partial fraction decomposition there is no a bound on the degree in partial fraction decomposition it doesn't have to be degree two on the on the uh, numerator what what you need to make sure is that the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. That's the important thing. Okay, so you could have degree 40 on the numerator, on, on the denominator, and it must be up to degree 39 on the numerator, so one less. Okay, if the degree on the numerator is greater or equal than the degree of, on the denominator, can anybody tell me what you're supposed to do? Not, not here, because you're not going to see it here but in integration, when you do integration. Does anybody remember? Exactly, you do long division, okay? You do long division and you reach the point of having degree on the denominator 
greater than the degree on the numerator. So, so that's, but, but here in this course, I, I promise you, you will never see such a situation. Okay? Okay, excellent. So these are the two formulas that we uh, need. And uh, let's solve an initial value problem. So use Laplace transform. in order to solve. And now you can, you, the, the nice thing is that you can do a, um, a, a mean, uh, um, a non-homogeneous one. I mean, uh, the, the homogeneous one is, is the simplest of all, but you can do a, a, a non-homogeneous one. So let me just give you an example, right? So let's do, y uh, double prime plus y is equal to e to the t. Why don't we do this? And then uh, let's say that y of zero is one and y prime of zero is zero. Okay, let's solve this initial value problem. Okay, does anybody have any questions before I proceed with uh, the solution based on the theory of the Laplace transform. Okay, so the idea is to, to take, so let F be a solution or rather the solution and set uh, F uppercase to be the Laplace transform of F. Our goal is to find F uppercase and then apply the inverse Laplace transform. That's, that's what we wish to do. So, um, so what do we have? The, uh, we want the Laplace transform of F double prime. In our differential equation, we don't really have the Laplace transform of, uh, uh, of F prime. So I'm going directly to that. That would be S square F. Uh, minus s times one minus zero, right? I just applied this formula right here. So this means to make a long story short, s square times f minus s, right? So uh, now I'm going to take the Laplace transform of both sides of the equation. And that is going to give me what? Uh, S square F minus S plus F is equal to the Laplace transform of E to the T, which is one over S minus one. And now the idea is you isolate S over to uh, F uh, algebraically. So you have S square plus one times F is equal to uh, S plus one over S minus one. You may want to clear denominators here. Clear denominators or, I mean, you know, here, here I guess you can do it both ways. So if, if I divide, then I will have F is equal to S over S squared plus one, plus one over S minus one times S squared plus one. And, and here, of course, uh, this uh, has Laplace transform cosine t, right? I mean, we know that already. And the question is, what is the inverse Laplace transform of this, right? And here's where I'm going to apply a partial fraction 
the composition. So um, I'm not sure we mentioned how to set this up, but but here's how we do it. Here's how we do it. So we have one over s minus one times s square plus one. Does anybody know how to set this up properly? What, what are the fractions that I should put? What are the fractions? So certainly I will have a over s minus one. But, but here comes the crucial one. What do I do about S squared plus one? What do I do? This is where things get interesting. Exactly, exactly. That's that's precisely right. Let's see why. If 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 naively, let's say we put S squared plus one, do you see what the problem is? That uh, generically on the left, you have a polynomial of the second degree because the denominator has degree three. But you have just two coefficients. Two coefficients are not enough to give you all the possibilities for a polynomial of the second degree because a polynomial of the second degree has three terms. So you need three coefficients. So the correct thing is what uh, your classmate suggested, which is BS plus C. Okay, so that's what you do when you have a power of a polynomial without roots, uh, of a second degree polynomial without roots uh, every single time. So now you can clear denominators and you will have uh, one is equal to, so you multiply both sides by s minus one times s squared plus one. So you have a times s squared plus one uh, plus um, bs plus c times s minus one. And now do you see uh, what how we can apply the trick? You can apply the trick only once here by setting s equal one. If you set s equal one, then um, what you get is one is equal to a times two, which tells you that a is equal to one half. Uh, how do you determine the rest of the coefficients? Simply by uh, multiplying out. So, um, so you have a plus b times s squared, right? And then you have, uh, how, uh, how about uh, s is? you have a CS and the minus BS. So you have minus B plus C times S. And how about constants? You have uh, A uh, minus C. So now, do you see what these things are supposed to be? This is supposed to be zero, right? This is also supposed to be zero, and this is supposed to be one. Why? Because that's what, that's what you have on the left-hand side. That's what you have on the left-hand side. Okay. And now, since you know that A is equal to one half, this one here gives you that C is equal to one half. And uh, this one here gives you, no, I'm sorry, this one doesn't give you, it's A minus C is equal to uh, one. Uh, which means that C is equal to A minus one, so it's negative one half. Sorry about this. And uh, from from this one, from the first one, uh, you get that uh, B has to be also equal to negative one half, so A plus B will add up to zero. So here are your three coefficients. So this means that the inverse Laplace transform of one over S minus one over S plus one square is equal to the inverse Laplace transform of uh, one half times one over S minus one plus one half uh, S plus one half over uh, S square plus one, which is, um, I should rewrite this as one half times one over S minus one plus one half times S over S squared plus one plus one half times one over S squared plus one. And this will give you one half E to the T 
plus one half cosine t plus one half sine t. So if you put everything together, remember that on the previous page we had seen that we have a, a cosine t, right? Then we get that uh, the solution y of t is equal to three halves cosine t plus one half sine t plus one half e to the t. And that's it. Okay. Okay, um, let's take our attendance. So for our attendance, I would like you to give me the inverse Laplace transform of e to the negative t. What is the inverse Laplace transform of e to the negative t? Send it on the chat, please. Yeah, technically, you need to put the denominator in parentheses, otherwise it looks like one over s plus one, right? Okay, great. And let's see if there are any questions, please. Let's see if we have any questions. No, uh, I, I already addressed this. It's, it's pretty much like uh, Calc uh, 3. We have uh, specific uh, cutoff points. Yeah. I might adjust those cutoff points if I feel that uh, there is any reason to believe that the exams were hard or anything like that. For the moment being, this doesn't appear to be the case. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, <laughs> that's a long discussion, I guess, but uh, I, I think I very much enjoy most of the classes that I teach. Okay. Yeah, I um, when when uh, you love mathematics, you find something beautiful in uh, pretty much everything. Uh, you may ask to teach a first grade uh, <laughs> class, and you can find really beautiful things. You can be asked to teach a class on Banach spaces, and uh, it's going to be the same. Uh, you will have to see me during my office hours. Um, the, the, uh, in, in fact, I already said that those who had a uh, low score should see me during uh, the office hours, okay? Yeah, the lower level you teach, the harder it is. That's always true. So, um, I remind you that my office hours at 11.50. Um, I hope to see you then. Okay, bye-bye.